religion begins on page 101 in the Book of Common Prayer. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. And blessed be his kingdom. Blessed Lord and Father, we have ascended in your name and in fellowship with one another. May you inspire your grace to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, to proclaim and respond to your holy word, 
be running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our oh Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever.
of the Apostle John, which we can infer were similar to the views of the rest of the disciples, we immediately recognize ourselves as a people within the midst of such situation. The disciples encountered someone who was acting outside of their core group. But this person was also using the name of Jesus. And so, of course, as human beings, they got suspicious and they ultimately got defensive. But those who whom the Gospel of Mark was written would have recognized themselves in the disciples' sense of competition over who can use Jesus' name, who is right, and who has the authority. Early Christians community, Christian communities, would have struggled in the midst of persecution, conflict as it relates to Jewish and Gentile relations, and all the difficulties of an infant church seeking identity and a faithful witness. At that time, Christian groups disagreed with one another. They contested each other's claims and even sought to censure each other in a bid to say that they are indeed the true followers of Christ. After two millennia, we see that even now, this kind of mindset prevails and exists in a very similar way in which it did in the early church in the first century. The church continues to disagree on issues of doctrine and interpretation. We continue to believe that each one of us has the actual truth and we try to tear down each other. We try to tear down each other so that we will have the most members in our pews, so that we will have the most money in our pockets, so that we will be the ones chosen at important ceremonies across the country to offer prayers or to give thanksgiving. This mindset continues to prevail among us even in this day. But Jesus addresses the concern of the disciples by responding in the first instance that whoever is not against them is for them. This is in stark contrast to an utterance from a former US president who said, Whoever is not with us is against us. Jesus then continues by making a very graphic and serious statement. Statements that were to be analyzed and contemplated by his disciples. And statements that we in our time today are called to do the same kind of wrestling with as we go forward. Jesus states clearly, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in you, it would be better for you if a great minister were hung around your neck and you'd be thrown into the sea. For those of you who don't want this, this is very heavy. As a matter of fact, you don't really need to use this. If a large stone is tied on our feet and we are thrown into the sea, there is no way we can escape. And this was the kind of image that Jesus wanted his disciples to get. Because he now turns his spotlight on the disciples themselves and on us today who declare that we too are disciples. Jesus warns that finger pointing and the distrust of others can distract us so that we do harm and cause others to stumble. In addition, even our best intentions to reprimand others can have unintended consequences for the innocent. Often times, 
sometimes great damage is done to the gospel when Christians are preoccupied with infighting and self-righteous proclamations about others. Jesus shifts the focus back to our own behaviors, the way we speak, and the way we live out the good news, and the way we face obstacles in the way of that good news. So I ask us to consider this morning, what stumbling blocks do you put in the way of others? What stumbling block do you put in the way of others? This, my friends, is not a rhetorical question. It is, however, a question for us to deeply explore, for us to deeply contemplate, and for us to deeply reflect on as we examine our lives in Christ. For many times, we who are called and equipped by God use our positions and standing in the church to make people stumble. When we are hard-hearted and resist new things that are happening in God's church, we cause people to stumble. When we try to suppress the talents of young people in our church by giving them a fight and by trying to exclude them from the worship of Christ, we are causing them to stumble. When persons come up with ingenious ideas in trying to help the church go forward and trying to create an atmosphere of change that the word of God may be able to be spread among various peoples and we try to stop it, we are causing people to stumble. When we sit down and we say that we are not going to be doing anything differently because this is how we have done it for the past half century, we are causing people to stumble. From verse 42 to 47, a Greek word is used, which is pronounced scandalon. A scandalon is an obstacle that people trip over, and when translated into the English, means stumbling block. And due to the moralistic tone of the word in our society today, scandal. Jesus could not have been more decisive in what he said. Because really, when we cause people to stumble, it is scandalous. Not scandalous for them, but scandalous for us who cause it. Jesus is pointing out the danger that his own followers can do. And he uses the direct image of drowning to get his point across. Better to drown. Better to be thrown into the sea with a big stone hung around your neck than to do harm to those who he describes as these little ones. Those described as these little ones are those who are infants in the faith. Whether they are children, whether they are older persons who have just accepted Christ, these are the persons who Jesus describes. Jesus points to the fact that the church is a minefield. Real dangers exist within the Christian community, particularly between the more mature disciples and those who he describes as the little ones. The followers who are closest to Jesus, his disciples, carry a huge weight of responsibility as a result of their intimacy with Christ. And because of this, others look to them for leadership. Others follow their examples. And others are influenced by their claims and practices. And these persons are especially vulnerable 
to the critiques and the conflicts that are around them. And so those of us who believe that we have an intimate relationship with Christ must also recognize that we also have a great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. A careless disciple can do irreversible damage to those most vulnerable within the body of Christ. This simply means, friends, that we have to always be on the ball as it relates to how we live our lives in Christ. We have to always be on our toes because someone is always watching us. Whether it be the children, whether it be those within our community, whether it be those within an educational environment, someone is always watching us. Someone is always there to see what we are doing. And so the question from two Sundays ago comes back. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because as I said last week, that question is not just answered by what we say, but it is answered by how we live our lives. And when people see how we're living our lives, then what they see becomes who Jesus is. And so we have a very important responsibility to allow persons to truly see the true nature of Christ, not tainted by our own sin, but to see who Christ is within this world and to accept him for who he is. Verses 43, 45, and 47 each point the stumbling blocks that are a part of our being. These verses speak to hands, feet, and eyes, the things that we hold dear to us. For none of us would want to lose a hand or a foot or an eye. And by using this imagery, Jesus makes it clear that stumbling blocks are not necessarily other people or things that are outside of us, but they are inherently a part of us. So the stumbling blocks that we face are not outside of the church. They are within the church. And the stumbling blocks that we face are not necessarily other people, but they are our own selves. They are a part of us. These stumbling blocks might be traditions or practices as we know it. As I said earlier, the way things have always been. Stumbling blocks that are that come disguised as precious body parts are so dangerous that they should be severed. And that is what Jesus was saying to his disciples. If you recognize that any part of you is a stumbling block, sever it. And he deliberately uses this imagery. Jesus uses a bold and striking description to get the disciples and all attention. Many of us may believe that there is nothing worse than losing a hand, a foot, or an eye. But Jesus tells us that the consequences of causing another to stumble are far worse than losing anyone of those limbs or body parts. When the things we hold on dearly to and believe that these things lead to eternal life, when these things become instead obstacles to the little ones, to those who are infants in the faith, Jesus tells us that it leads to death, death, in unquenchable fire. 
if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life again and to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. At every point in time when Jesus uses that kind of imagery, notice what he says, it is better. It is better for you to suffer in this way than to lead one of these little ones down the wrong path. Jesus is saying that self blame is preferable to the atrocities against others we commit with these parts of ourselves. And Jesus warns us of the consequences of our actions and lays on us the seriousness of what we profess and who we are as God's people. And many times as a church, we avoid speaking of the consequences of our actions. We avoid speaking about hell and the unquenchable fire. We avoid thinking and contemplating about this kind of end to our lives. But Jesus makes it clear that if we indeed commit such atrocities, that there is a consequence. A consequence that I am sure that none of us will want to face. And so it is for us to reflect and for us to make a conscientious decision as to whether or not we will continue to work for evil or to work for God. For in our actions of causing others to stumble, we are indeed doing the devil's work. And sometimes we think to ourselves that I'm a good person. I give my offering. I come to church. I do good things. But in causing persons or these little ones to stumble, Sometimes it's not the things that we do, friends, but it's the things that we do not do. For when we confess, we say we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, in things done and things left undone. Sometimes it's the things that we do not do. Sometimes it's that moment we do not take to listen to someone who is in distress. Sometimes it is the things that we sit down and say that we are not going to do because someone else is there to do it. It is in those instances, friends, that many times we are indeed doing the devil's work. And we are not even aware of the fact that that is what we are doing. But in assessing these words of promise and judgment, Mark calls upon Jesus' teaching to be, as described, the salt of the world. If as the people of God and followers of Jesus, we lose sight of our purpose to honor and worship God and to serve others, we are like salt that has lost its intended purpose and is only good to be discarded. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Jesus calls us to live as was intended by God by reminding us that we must have salt in ourselves and be at peace with one another. Many times, friends, we lose our saltiness. We lose our drive or zeal, or passion for God. And when that happens, we lose sight of our ultimate mission and purpose within the body of Christ. And so Jesus reminds those persons around him that we are indeed the salt of the world. We are those persons called to inject holiness within our society. We are the persons called to ensure that the gospel of Christ is proclaimed, not just from our lips, 
but thy our very actions. And so, friends, when we look around us and we see all the atrocities within our society, we see our crime in crime statistics. We see more and more acts of violence within schools, among young people. We recognize, friends, that many of us who come to church Sunday after Sunday have indeed lost our souls. And so, in order for us to be able to go back to the very heart of who we are as God's people, we must remember the call of God on our lives. We must be able to go back to that place where we initially found our saltiness. We must remember that this is the call, identity, and pillar of discipleship, which is the peace that Christ offers to us and to all call themselves followers of Christ. We should not arrogantly overlook the needs of the little ones around us. And sometimes we have to deny ourselves those things that mean so much to us for the ultimate building of the kingdom of God. Ultimately, friends, it is a life of sacrifice. It is a life where we sit down and we analyze who we are as God's people and make a decision as to where we go and to what we are willing to sacrifice. Let us remember that Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. And any sacrifice we make pales in comparison to that ultimate sacrifice. And so now we are called, friends, as a church to exist as one body, to exist as one people. And in existing as one body and as one people, we will be able to be in a place where we are less inclined to put stumbling blocks before people. So, friends, we are called to reflect on these words from the Gospel according to Mark. Are we putting stumbling blocks before persons? And if we recognize that we are, what are we going to do to ensure that we stop? How are we going to address this situation? Are we willing to see intervention? Are we willing to get the help that we need? Because friends, as Jesus said, it is better for you to enter life in than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God in one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the world never dies and the fire is never quenched. We all have that opportunity to make better friends. Let us do so as we go forward as possible.